Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And we're really delighted to, to be joined by J Julian Zelizer, who is one of the leading historians and political analysts uh, in the United States. Julian has an undergraduate degree uh, from Brandeis University and then a master's and doctorate from Johns Hopkins, studied history there. Um, he has taught at State University of New York in Albany, um, uh, Boston University, and then also at Princeton. He's been at Princeton for, for nearly a decade. Julian is a prolific writer. He's written many, many books, really, really good books. Uh, he, had a, he has a book out this year called Abraham Joshua Heschel, Life of Radical Amazement about a Jewish rabbi who was a critical force in the civil rights movement. He's written a book called Burning Down the House about Newt Gingrich. Um, a couple books I have here, Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. He co-wrote this with a, a Princeton colleague. Another book called The Fierce Urgency of Now about Lyndon Johnson and Congress in the Civil Rights Movement. <coughs> Excuse me. And then about a decade ago wrote a book that's called Arsenal of Democracy, The Politics of National Security, which is very, very relevant now, of course. Um, and he also has a book that's going to be coming out in April. Um, he's the editor of a book called uh, the, the Presidency of Donald Trump, A First Historical Assessment. Julian, you may have seen him on CNN. He's a political analyst there. You can hear him on NPR. And he also has a terrific podcast that he does with a, a Princeton colleague called Politics and Polls that is really quite uh, interesting to watch. Um, or to listen to. So uh, Julian is joining us from his office in Princeton, New Jersey. So thanks so much, Julian. Thanks for having me. Nice to be with you. Julian, we had a, an interview about a year ago with Margaret McMillan, a, a historian, and I asked her, you know, how she became interested in history. And she kind of joked, she said when she was a, a youngster, the, the, the kind of competing polls were figure skating, ballet, and then history. Uh, she said history went out. But then she also said, you know, for her, she views the study of history as really kind of both fun and a high calling in which, you know, she she really relishes the challenge of of trying to understand the past and explaining it. Tell us about you, how you became a historian. Yes, I mean, that's a, always a good question. And I don't think I really figured out that's what I wanted to do until maybe late high school or early college. And, and part of it for me was politics. I loved uh, already by that time politics. I was becoming very interested in following what was going on. And for me, the most interesting path to understanding how we are where we are today was by looking at history as opposed to economics um, or, or political science. And then there was, I remember reading uh, Parting the Waters, which is Taylor Branch's book on the civil rights movement. I think it was late high school that I read it, and it really kind of engaged me uh, in that case as a way to understand race relations through the past. And then in college, that just all came together by my junior and senior year, and I, I haven't stopped since. Did you have any other, uh, growing up, other favorite historians in addition to Branch, who has written this, as you say, this kind of epic three-volume uh, three series of the civil rights movement? Were there other historians that, that really grabbed your attention? Yeah, I mean, growing it was really in college. I was not someone before college who uh, was was focused on this. I, I liked studying, but I liked doing other things uh, more. Um, but in college, there were a bunch of historians. That probably the most important for me was Richard Hofstetter, uh, who taught at Columbia and, and wrote a number of landmark books like The Age of Reform or The American Political Tradition. And I just loved his writing. It was provocative, it was big ideas history, um, and it was trying to kind of use the past or understand the past as a way, not just to know the present, but to open up debates about who and what we are as a country. And so his writing um, was incredibly influential to me. Well, talk about how you balance teaching and writing. I know you have a very active teaching uh, uh, responsibilities at Princeton. Um, so t then you're, you're, you're always working on books and commentaries and so forth. How do you balance the two? And are they, I mean, some say that they're complementary, and others say that when they're working on a big book, they have to pull back a little bit on teaching. I mean, how does that work for you? No, I like, I'm an all at once person. And um it all works together for me. And I think when I'm doing everything and I'm doing everything at the same pace, it actually makes it easier. Uh, my, my teaching, sometimes it's directly related to what I'm working on. So 
I'm writing now, I'm just starting a book on uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964, which was a civil rights group. And I'm teaching a seminar at Princeton on 1964. I did that intentionally. And there's moments like that, it's just a great way you kind of work out ideas and undergraduates are terrific in forcing you to think about basic questions that you sometimes don't because you're so into a project. And other times, you know, they just, the, the questions you want grow out of different pockets of what you're doing. You might be writing something and you think that would be great to talk about with my undergraduates or in the middle of a class, you might say something that triggers an opinion piece uh, that I end up working on. So they all kind of work together and I'm very disciplined. I work every day uh, and that's the secret for me of, of doing this and doing uh, so much, but I'm also just at all levels doing something that I love from the writing to the teaching. And that kind of moves me forward um, always. Well, you, have, you are uh, described as a political historian, really one of the leader, leading political historians. And I was, you know, I, I've been reading a little bit about the kind of the, the debates within the historical profession. And I came across a quote by a, kind of a legendary uh, writer, William Luchtenberg. And he, he wrote this some time ago. He says, by the mid 1980s, the status of the political historian had sunk to somewhere between that of a faith healer and a chiropractor. Political historians were all right in their way but you might not want to bring one home to meet the family. Um, what, what, t t in brief, what was the, de what is or what was the debate on political history, I guess maybe versus social history? Describe what, what the essence of that discussion or debate is. Yeah, that's a great quote and it's funny. In graduate school, I think I used that quote in so many different talks. I was in graduate school in the 90s and the point was that after the 60s, that the baby boom generation of historians who, start to have jobs in the 70s and 80s, were very interested in understanding the country, not from the perspective of Washington, but from the perspective of social movements, from the perspective of the everyday life that is lived by different uh, groups, demography and the life of the family, how gender and race work. So they were studying history from the bottom up, which was fantastic. I mean, it really opened up what uh, studying history meant and the kinds of issues that we addressed, but politics, formal politics kind of fell by the wayside. There was less writing on public policy, less writing on presidents. It was seen as something that wasn't really representative of what most people felt or what this country was about. And when I went to graduate school in the 90s, I was part of a cohort that tried to bring political history back, bring formal politics back, but in ways that responded to the critique of the social historians, that politics wasn't, a president didn't represent the nation, a president was a leader within a particular political institution, and that's how we had to study that person. And so I was fortunate to be part of a cohort, there were a number of us who reinvigorated and revived political history, uh, but we didn't just do it in a defiant fashion, saying, social and cultural history, you know, missed out, but rather we tried to do it in new ways and we've been working on it ever since. And now political history is a standard part of uh, the profession uh, in many departments. This is part of the curricula and this is a big part of publishing. Um, and it's wonderful to watch new generations of graduate students not even think of that debate anymore. It's more a question of What's the most interesting topic to tackle? Right. Well, let's talk about your book, Fault Lines. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it, it, it emanated from a course that you uh, co-taught at Princeton with a, uh, with a colleague about, and effectively how the United, the United States from 1974 to the present. Um, and I tell people that if, if they want to understand how the United States has evolved as it has, this is the book to start with and, and to linger on because it really gives a, a really important framework. And I want to read a couple sentences and then just have you kind of expand on that. You write, the turbulent decade of the 1960s caused the common ground of the, of the mid 20th century to crumble beneath America's feet. Rather than seek to find new sources of agreement, the nation reconstituted itself in the 1970s and the decades that followed in ways that augmented 
and institutionalized these lines of division. Believing con con consensus was beyond reach, Americans sought to guarantee that different voices could be heard and divergent views could be seen. Abandoning the search for common ground in political and economic life, they increasingly valued competition and even conflict. From the 1970s on, the United States would seem less and less united with each passing decade. Expand. Yeah, I mean, so A, yes, this came out of a course that we taught. I still teach it. We had to split up our duties over time. And, and after we were teaching it for a while, the period no one learned about, basically, uh, in high school or college, we made it into a book. And, and the uh, idea behind what you read was we're always divided as a nation. And uh, there's always deep divisions in the 50s and 60s. We saw uh, intense debates in this country over race relations, over the Vietnam War. But what was interesting is you had institutions that worked against that very uh, directly. So, for example, the political parties in the 50s and 60s were deeply divided internally. You had in the Democratic Party, liberal Northerners and conservative Southerners. In the Republican Party, you had Midwestern uh, anti-government Republicans, and you had New Yorkers like Jacob Javits, who were pretty liberal by contemporary standards. And so the parties kind of pushed toward bipartisanship inherently. The media, one more example, uh, was structured very differently. You only had a small number of news sources. You had the TV networks, you had a handful of newspapers, and there was very tight production and editorial control before information came out. And so what we were interested in the period since the 70s was not, was there more division than there used to be, but why did the institutions, how did the institutions that came out of the 60s, how were they remade in ways that actually facilitated and they aggravated the divisions in the country rather than pushing against them? And so we kind of have a narrative and through the narrative, we tell the story of how did our parties move far apart? How did the news media become so much more partisan and unfiltered? Uh, what happens when you lose unions as a base of the economy? Uh, and what did that have to do with inequality and economic division? So now that's what the statement is. And that's how our thinking was as we set out to write the narrative. Well, and let's drill down on a couple of the, the realms in which these divisions are most apparent. And, and as you, you mentioned earlier, I mean, the, the, the federal government, which had been at one point a kind of a, a cohering force, um, you know, in 74, of course, President Nixon resigned, 75, the United States effectively left Vietnam. Um, and um, so, so uh, faith in, in government um, eroded significantly. Um, and then also coupled with that, and you mentioned the political parties, <clears throat> excuse me, as you had said, the parties used to be broad coalitions. Um, but then when in 1972, there was, you know, first in the Democratic Party, a, a new approach to primaries that altered how, you know, how candidates got elected. So talk about that one pillar about sort of the government losing its effectively, it's, it's kind of unquestioned authority. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the two strands of that one is uh, certainly since Franklin Roosevelt, but even really before the federal government um, just had gained great stature in this country, it was just a very important force throughout different regions of the country. So obviously, in the North, um, government was very present, very visible and an integral part in, in a state like New York uh, of the daily life of, you know, kind of uh, helping to build the highways and provision social safety net provision for citizens. But in the South, the TVA, as an example, was a, a key form of um, government support for developing uh, parts of the country and, and just government as an entity after, after the Roosevelt Revolution, so to speak, held great weight. And that falls apart. I mean, the, the role of government first with Vietnam and Watergate takes a hit. And then obviously with the conservative revolution of the 70s uh, and 80s really discredits that unifying force uh, or that, that presence. It becomes a source of contention um, rather than a, a source pulling us together. And the second is not totally related, but you have the parties change dramatically. So rather than two parties that are internally divided, you get by the 80s and 90s, two parties where there are very few internal divisions. 
uh, fewer in the GOP than the Democratic Party, we argue. And so the party move a- apart. And the number of people in Congress, for example, who self-identify through their votes as moderates just steadily diminishes during this period. And this happens in the electorate as well. And so uh, it's a loss of faith in government. And it's also a reconstitution of the party. So there's very little common ground on most of the core issues that we deal with. And the other huge pillar of this kind of consensus was, you know, just a, a kind of a strong economy. And you say uh, perhaps even more so than the federal government, the industrial economy of the post-war era served as a pillar of American prosperity. And, and, and you trace effectively the de-industrialization uh, that might be a little bit too strong, but just the, the, the kind of, you know, the sort of, to some extent, the erosion of the power of the of the manufacturing economy and how that was has destabilized American life. Very important story. I mean, another of my favorite historians uh, you asked earlier uh, is someone named Jim, Jim Patterson, James Patterson, who was a really great historian at Brown. And he wrote a terrific book uh, on the U.S. since uh, World War II through the 70s. And it was all about that era being one of grand expectations, that the economy uh, was growing so fast and it was rooted in the manufacturing sector in states like Michigan, um, where the automobile industry was. It was bringing more and more people into the middle class. It was kind of creating a, a world which not everyone participated in, but many more Americans were enjoying higher education part because of the GI Bill of Rights. They were able to purchase their own home, which was not the norm uh, before this period. And there was simply the expectation uh, that you could be part of this middle class and that your kids certainly would be part of it, uh, if, if not better. And that starts to fall away. The 70s is a devastating economic decade. We have the energy crisis throughout the 70s. We have what's called stagflation, um, which is the combo of inflation and unemployment, which was really uh, pretty um, devastating to many American families. And uh, all of this is happening as that manufacturing sector is getting much, much weaker. And so uh, Japan and West Germany, for example, are posing a lot of competition. Jobs are moving either to the South where there's fewer unions uh, and less regulation, or they're starting to move overseas. Um, and so that pillar of the economy, which I think was a very important uh, reason there was more consensus at some level in the 50s or 60s dissipates. And without that economic foundation, a lot of the fault lines in this country will only become uh, worse and worse. And obviously, one other element of that is that earlier period of grand expectations uh, rested not only on manufacturing as an industry, but unionized jobs, which literally gave uh, working Americans a path to this middle class life. Unions will steadily diminish after the 70s, and that's no longer true. You know, as I was reading your book, I was thinking about my own experience. I grew up in Peoria, Illinois, and a Caterpillar Tractor Company, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, was just, you know, the dynamo of the region. And, you know, high school friends would graduate and they would take jobs at CAT and, you know, maybe they wouldn't go to college and they'd get really nice paying jobs, great benefits. And, you know, I bumped into some of them, you know, a few years ago and th these jobs have moved elsewhere. CAT moved its world headquarters up to Chicago. And just a huge part of the vitality of the community has been sapped by this deindustrialization in the in really in the in the kind of the the uh, the example of one company. Yeah, and and some of this has uh, not been reversed, but obviously we've seen the emergence uh, and um, flourishing of of the high tech industry of healthcare, which is a big industry in some of these areas. Um, where those manufacturing jobs dissipated, the service sector. Um, and, and some of that has compensated uh, for what is felt in uh, Peoria or a city like Flint. Um, some of those cities and towns, though, have not fully recovered. And certainly in the 70s and 80s, which is kind of this turning point period, none of this is really felt yet. So all you have is economic devastation as some of these political divisions are hardening uh, between the parties.
Well, Julian, you write, um, as the political and economic foundations of the post-war decades cracked apart in the 1970s, the era's racial order crumbled as well. Explain what, what, you, what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there, there is this moment in the early first half of the 60s where the civil rights movement, which has been forming and expanding for several decades by that time, starts to achieve legislative success. And uh, the, the high point of civil rights policy certainly is the Civil Rights Act of 64, which ends legal segregation, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, where the federal government commits to protecting voting rights. But by the 70s and 80s, um, you see that is starting to be much halt, more halting. And as the debate turns to questions of institutional racism, uh, it's much harder to find areas of consensus and the backlash against civil rights is often stronger than the push for legislations to address criminal justice reform or racism and housing. And so these issues um, are deteriorating and becoming much more volatile by the 1980s and 90s. And, and you even have by that time politics, politicians who are playing on some of this anger and resentment not always explicitly, but they're certainly playing on it. Well, and you write also about um, that in some of the, the policy efforts uh, to preserve individual cultures and communications, uh, com communities and cultures eroded a sense of national identity and national community. And you said, you know, instead of a coherent and a cohesive identity, now Americans now had diversity and division. Talk about yeah. that, if you would. Yeah, and, and not some of this is not a bad or good thing. So in this case, Kevin and I wrote about uh, this issue. And, and you see in the 70s and 80s this remarkable moment, especially in the 70s, where there's kind of a revitalization of the idea of cultural identity and uh, not so much focused on assimilation into some national culture, uh, so much as actually embracing unique and distinct uh, elements of where one comes from and the particularities of a community rather than trying to ignore those particularities. And you see this all across the board. I mean, in pop culture, you know, there's all these movies, uh, including The Godfather, about Italian culture, not, not the organized crime part. But if you think of the wedding in the opening scene and kind of the beauty and the music and the food, and you see this in different realms. Uh, there's obviously after the black power movement uh, in, in all realms of culture, real embrace uh, of uh, African-American identity uh, throughout this period. And, and you see this across the board and this doesn't really go away. I think uh, we remain in a period where you, you see this after kind of waves of immigration uh, have reshaped the electorate where uh, many uh, Americans and, and new Americans, old Americans are happy uh, and proud of their distinct identity within the American fabric, rather than saying everyone just has to follow uh, rules A, B, and C. And, and obviously the, the downside of that is it does make it harder uh, to even imagine clear unity. Um, but I think most people think there's been great benefit to this, this new conception of a more, not fragmented national identity, but one that is not so coherent or unified. Well, Julian, one of the really powerful parts of your book, the, the book that you and Kevin did too, talks about the communications revolution and how, the effect that it has had on the United States. And you, uh, you talk about a lot of the changes, but focus on three of them in particular, the rise of cable TV, personal computers, and then the internet. And for some of our students, they may not remember, they, they might assume that these things have been here for you know decades, but these are relatively new in the historical scheme innovations. Talk about maybe broadly the, the communications yeah. revolution and how that has played a role in fragmenting the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really an important part of our book. And, and it's one of those areas that became more important as we were writing it. And, and it's integral to the class I still teach at Princeton, where most students, is, it's exactly what you're saying. They can't even imagine a world without. Um, so that's one of the interesting things about teaching it that uh, kind of quizzical look you get from students like this is new. 
Um, and so, yes, uh, a cable television really only becomes a force in the 70s and 80s. And a key part of that is satellite technology uh, that allows for much easier broadcasting and deregulations uh, that allowed stations to use that technology. And one of the things cable does is it creates a 24 hour news cycle, um, which fundamentally changes the pace uh, and intensity of news. It also creates, for example, stations that are devoted entirely to news. So it's not only that you have all the time in the world, you have stations such as CNN or Fox later and MSNBC, which are constantly uh, uh, putting, putting out news at, at a clip where it's harder to control what comes out. Uh, and so cable kind of uh, erodes the filters in some ways and accelerates the pace of how we get our information. And over time, you have channels like Fox where partisan news delivery becomes a norm. Uh, and we have more examples of that. Uh, and so the older idea of a network television news show, which was 30 minutes, that's it, uh, each night, which only meant 22 minutes because you had advertising. Uh, and the reporters went to great lengths to present themselves as objective and to try to adhere to that standard goes by the wayside. So you have a much more uh, kind of fragmenting news cycle. Personal computers are incredibly important. Uh, computing has been around since, certainly since World War II, but it was mainframe computers as opposed to what we get by the 80s, which are personal computers. And this is a real revolution, obviously, in terms of communication and technology, but in terms of information and how we receive it and produce it, it will have very significant changes. It will kind of put information in the hands of the amateur, uh, which is both empowering, but also destabilizing because over time, it's very easy to get information out, uh, even at an international level. And it's much harder to control what an individual is going to take in because that computer is giving them basically whatever they want. In the realm of politics, we've seen the effects of this. Um, you can get disinformation. You can get just lots of openly partisan information. Uh, and that changes the, the character um, of, of, of information flows. And finally, the internet uh, is obviously related to this, but uh, it's kind of the final step in the revolution of uh, 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 that creates a, an arena of political and other sorts of news information that can be very partisan, where the filters are almost non-existent and where the speed of information is so fast, it's hard to undo things that are incorrect. Uh, and so we follow each of these uh, right through today. And Julian, in addition to these big forces that continue to shape American society, your book tells us about the human beings who helped uh, direct some of these forces, kind of ride the wave in a few cases. Um, and, and I guess one figure who, who looms large in your book is Ronald Reagan, um, in part because he uh, found a way to bring together disparate uh, factions in the Republican Party into a, a force built largely around, you know, the notion of reducing the scope of government, tax cuts, fighting communism. Talk about Reagan as, as a critical force in America for the last half century. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the another element of our book is just all the different social movements that uh, continue well after the 60s and the biggest in many ways is the conservative movement and the conservative movement in the 70s is powerful, but it's fragmented. It has all kinds of different factions that don't always agree with each other. You have the religious right as one example that's pushing for um, what they call traditional cultural values, that's um, fighting against certain changes in, in reproductive rights, such as new abortion, uh, the, the abortion ruling with Roe v. Wade and, and much more. But then you have Wall Street, uh, conservatives who want tax cuts and deregulation, but they really have nothing uh, in common with someone like Jerry Falwell. And so the question going into the 80s was, can this all come together or is it just going to be this fragmented movement? And one of the things that's so important about Reagan is not just his charisma or his ideas, but he figures out a way to bring them together. And he, and he hones in on two issues, anti-communism, and he pits himself against both Democrats and Republicans 
who had believed in the 70s that negotiation with the Soviets was possible, and then tax cuts. And tax cuts are a theme that every faction in the Republican Party or in the conservative movement is good with. And so he's elected an alien, and, and, and that's part of the story. And then the second is more philosophical. He finds a way uh, to talk and to promote ideas of uh, anti-government uh, and an anti-government philosophy that a few decades earlier when Barry Goldwater and in 64 were considered way too extreme. But he is someone, uh, in part because he comes up with this conservative movement, who's able to shift the debate in American politics to the right. He doesn't eliminate liberal ideas and he doesn't eliminate liberal policies, we argue, but part of his power is that. And, and then there's just the accomplishment of the negotiations with Gorbachev, um, which actually go against a lot of what he was about. But you see his skill as a leader in that in 85, 86 and 87, he breaks with his own past in many ways and he departs from his own rhetoric and when an opportunity emerges to negotiate with the Soviet Union, he takes it uh, and he'll work with Gorbachev to achieve a historic arms agreement in 87. Well, a very different type of conservative um, is, is Newt Gingrich and you've actually written a book on, on Gingrich and you write about him uh, well and insightfully in this book and, and Gingrich in some extent is a embodies a, 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 an idea of politics as warfare, as opponents, as as it's not just you know honorable adversaries, but almost enemies. Talk about the role of Newt Gingrich, um, really, in a modern American politics. Yeah, he was an incredibly uh, significant figure, I think, and obviously, I argue in certainly the Republican Party, the modern Republican Party, but in contemporary politics and. He uh, embraced an idea of kind of, I call smash mouth partisanship, uh, uh, an idea of partisanship where there's really no boundaries to what you say or do in pursuit of partisan power. And he's elected in 78, he comes to Washington in 79. And by the 80s, long before he's Speaker of the House, and even before he has a, a leadership position, He's promoting these ideas with the GOP, and he's arguing uh, to fellow Republicans who have been in the minority in Congress since 1955 that if you ever want to obtain power, you have to abandon these ideas of civility and bipartisanship, and you have to be willing to tear down your opponent in ruthless fashion. Politics was warfare for Gingrich, and Gingrich's story is important because he is elevated into the leadership. There's always people such as Gingrich in politics, but what you see is first in 1989, after he brings down the Speaker of the House, Jim Wright, he uh, becomes the House Minority Whip. Uh, and then he will be elected as Speaker of the House in 1995. And he institutionalizes these very aggressive ideas about partisanship at the highest levels of party power. And I think when I observed the Trump presidency, uh, there were many distinct parts of what Trump did, but his playbook really was very similar to Newt Gingrich. And, and Gingrich even put out a memo in 1990, um, which is all about language. And it's a fascinating memo. You can Google it and find it. He sent it out through something called GoPack, um, which was his communication um, pack with candidates. And, and he basically said, you have to be much tougher in the language you're willing to use about Democrats, call them traitors and call them, you know, radical, treasonous. The words are unbelievable at the time. Today, they seem kind of mild. Um, but all of this was really important. And I think it remained uh, how a lot of Republican leaders think about what's legitimate or not. Well, another figure that looms large in that your book is Barack Obama, uh, perhaps beginning with his speech in Boston in 2004, culminating in his nomination in 2008 and his two terms. And you said that, you know, Obama tried to bring together these various these various elements of American life in terms of looking for unity in politics, race, economics, gender and so forth. And you write the overwhelming response it generated highlighted the ways in which Americans were still searching for common ground after decades of growing apart. 
How does a historian look at the Obama presidency? Yeah, I, I mean, that storyline is important, both for the, certainly by 2008, uh, the thirst that still exists in the American electorate for something different than the way we had moved since the 70s. There, there still is always this hope uh, for some kind of unity or for some kind of national vision rather than partisan vision of who we are. But that story doesn't work out the way he anticipated. I mean, his whole speech in 2004 is about why we don't have a red or blue America, we have a United States of America. And he kind of goes through each stereotype and argues that it, it doesn't really characterize the different regions. But his presidency it becomes incredibly contentious and the Republicans move even further to the right with the Tea Party. And so one story of, of the Obama presidency is the failure to achieve what he hoped, and in some ways why that speech didn't reflect where American politics was anymore. You can't do that. Um, we also try to cover some of the transformative elements of, of what he did. He was a significant figure, obviously simply being elected uh, as a Black American is a milestone uh, that is really unequaled in many ways in Washington national politics. But he also, in that first couple of years, pushes through some pretty significant legislation, such as the Affordable Care Act, despite the divided country we are, that have had long-term ramifications. And I think we're only starting, really, uh, to absorb the significance of some of what he achieved in that first you know, period of his presidency. Well, you, you, you nicely describe the obstacles he faced. And you, in fact, at one point you quote uh, Republican Senator George Voinovich, who said, quote, if he was for it, we had to be against it. And you, off, and you also talk about the, 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 the Affordable Care Act, talking about the very strong Republican opposition, although, you know, it's sort of its genesis was a health care alternative that the Republicans had offered to Clinton's health care package in 93 and also something Governor Romney did in, as governor of Massachusetts. So Obama effectively you know, borrowed from the Republican package, presented it, and then faced almost united Republican opposition to it. Yeah, I mean, I think what Obama, uh, the former President Obama, didn't totally grasp early on where the Republican Party had moved. Uh, and, and one of the things we argue in the book is we take this idea that you'll hear if you follow the news a lot of asymmetric partisanship, meaning that as a whole, Republicans moved much further to the right than Democrats as a whole moved to the left, and that the Republican leadership became much more unified around a rightward set of policies and an aggressive form of partisanship than Democrats did. And you can see it obviously in 2020, you have Biden, who is the embodiment of a much more fragmented party, and Trump, who kind of takes a deep dive into division and partisanship. But Obama still, went, I think his speech was genuine in 2004. And when he talks with Democrats after his election, he tells them, I'm still going to pursue and try to obtain Republican support for some of these ideas. And the premise of an Affordable Care Act that's modeled on Mitt Romney's plan in Massachusetts is just that. How can they say no to something that's very much in the center in terms of health care reform and something which you can actually connect to a very prominent Republican at the time? But that wasn't really how the Republicans on Capitol Hill were thinking. Uh, the goal was to obstruct. The goal was to really shut down any kind of legislative progress. And what's really interesting is in Obama's memoirs, which came out a year ago or two years ago, he's open about this. And he talks a lot about not really getting where the Republican Party had shifted and why it was almost impossible to achieve the goal he himself set out to achieve. Well, in your book, the first and your last chapter deals with President Trump. And you write, quote, in one sense, the fracturing of the United States would have continued apace no matter who was in the White House. Trump had been, in many ways, the result of the trends decades in the making. He was ultimately more, of a, more a product of a polarized political environment and an increasingly hard-edged media climate than a producer of it. Ex elaborate on that. Yeah, look, there's two ways of thinking of the Trump presidency. One is to think of it as a cause. And so here we have very divided electorate and polarized and contentious 
political environment and to say, well, President Trump uh, did this. He did this through his Twitter. He did this through his rallies. The other way is which how we think of it is he's a product of this multi-decade set of changes in politics produced a moment where someone like Donald Trump could win the nomination in 2016, could win the election, and ultimately could retain the support generally of Republicans, even with all the unconventional things uh, he did. You can't understand that if you don't kind of understand the history we try to trace in the book. And we wrote this book before most of it was already done before Trump was uh, was even considered uh, a candidate. We had to add a chapter, we rewrote the introduction, but in some ways that was helpful because we really did see him as a product of the year. And, and unlike Obama, he was comfortable with our political world. He wanted to exploit all the things we're talking about in the book. He saw how the media had changed and how it worked and he exploited it. He used Twitter to feed this very contentious media environment rather than to move against it. He played to the base, which really meant playing to the partisan interests of the party rather than trying to find some elusive center. Uh, and so to understand him, you really need to understand how the political world was remade over decades, which then gives you insight into how do we get a Trump presidency. Well, one fact that you mentioned is just, you know, the kind of the spectacle of the Trump campaign was just irresistible for, for the media, particularly cable television. And you, you note that 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 one study uh, found that President Trump, uh, candidate Trump, got about three billion dollars of free media during the primaries, which was more than the rest of the 16 or 17 person field combined and eight times more uh, than the second place person. And then you quote, a, a, you know, really profoundly, it was either the president of NBC News or NBC who, who was talking about, I think, the Trump phenomenon more generally. He says, it may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. Right. And so that gets back to our earlier conversation with cable. You had, uh, you know, you, you have news networks on cable. You also have with the Internet, uh, kind of ongoing uh, news, newspapers or online zines, whatever you want to call them, they're constantly running. They're constantly operating. They're constantly in search of news. Um, but he exploited that because he said, well, they want content and I will give them content. And he also understood that in an era of clickbait uh, and retweets and likes, the kind of content that often got privileged was provocative, sensational content. And I think his campaign in 2016 thrived on this. He understood at some instinctive level that if you say incredibly polarizing and controversial things, you're going to get attention. It's almost too seductive uh, for the entire media ecosystem to ignore. And uh, because of that understanding, he was able to kind of elevate himself very quickly and gain ongoing attention. Um, even when he was saying things which were clearly, you know, beyond the pale uh, in the minds of most people who followed politics or who are part of politics. Well, Julian, you conclude your book by asking, I guess, the question all of us are asking. You say the question that the United States of America now faces as a divided country is whether we can harness the intense energy that drives us, that now drives us apart and channel it once again toward creating new and stronger bridges that can bring us together whether the fault lines of the past four decades will continue to fracture or whether these rifts will finally start to heal is a chapter yet to come. You wrote those words four or five years ago, three or four years right. ago. What, uh, do you have any, any sense of, of the answer? Well, if, if you're someone who's looking for less fracture, you're probably not gonna be uh, very optimistic at this point. This book was done before the pandemic and uh, the pandemic offered a crisis unlike almost any we've been through, other than the Great Depression and perhaps war, in terms of just the national impact and the impact on our most personal lives. And yet, none of the things we write about disappeared in any way. Uh, in some ways, they intensified to the point where fighting about the most basic public health measures became sources of bitter contention. And and the media ecosystem we talked about 
it became a way in which it was much harder uh, for government officials to deal with the pandemic and to get out good information. All of that only accelerated. Um, so from where we sit today uh, in March of uh, 2022, uh, you have to think that that last paragraph of uh, the book, uh, it, it looks like we're continuing uh, where we were when we finished that book. And, and there's no real sign it's changing. Look, you can take an issue like where are Americans on Russia um, and Ukraine, which again is such an egregious thing that we're watching. You would hope that there's consensus. And right now there actually is more consensus than people thought in both parties. But my guess is that's going to dissipate. I'm kind of waiting for that turning point moment where this becomes like face masks, just another issue um, that we fight over. Julian, we have a couple questions that were emailed in. And the first one yep. comes from Charles and Hoffman, who states, who ask, um, to what degree are there parallels between current political schisms and the intense sectionalism we have seen through time? Yeah, that's good. I mean, some of it is over, kind of layered over. So meaning the base of the Republican Party after the 1960s became uh, the South and really the Sun Belt became the heart of the party. And we've seen how the coasts became uh, a bastion of um, democratic strength. And so the story of the South, which is one of the most important ongoing regional stories uh, in American history, uh, remains pertinent to the partisanship. I mean, you can still argue the base of the GOP really is the South. And some of the issues we, we have dealt with uh, from race um, to regulation uh, can be understood in the same kind of positions Southern Democrats had in the 40s and 50s are only being articulated now by Southern Republicans, but there's a regional element that said, there's other elements of partisanship and polarization that I don't think are just all about uh, geography. And certainly when you're talking about the media, the media is very national in scope now. It's not a regional media anymore. It's actually different than in the 50s and 60s. And so there's also very strong nationalizing partisan forces that aren't always the same as kind of regional bias and regional preference. And, and I would just add, sorry, I mean, the parties have become more national. And so part of what's happening is the with the GOP, as an example, the Republican national leadership reaches into the most local of Southern contests and not only provides money and support, but will also kind of shape what kinds of issues and what kinds of questions a local candidate, not even running for Congress, but running for local office. We're seeing this all the time now with schools and public health will talk about. So it's also flipped in some ways in which even the regional divisions you might still see are being fueled uh, by national party strategy. Good, thanks. Uh, Andrea from McCann to ask, how did the concept of quote, cancel culture enter American political discourse? And do you, be do you believe it's de detrimental to academic culture? Yeah, I mean, there's always been certainly for many decades, we've had versions of this debate. Um, for those, not your students, I'm sure, but for those of us who lived through the 80s um, and 90s, the whole question and debate over political correctness was, it was just another term to talk about um, kind of how should the conversation unfold over uh, a number of issues related to gender and race and ethnic identity which had been opened up as a result of 60s politics, where activists said, we can't just talk about things the way we used to talk about them. And we have to even take language as something that's serious. It's not insignificant in how students think. And so it, cancel culture, I don't know when the term actually entered the lexicon. I, I assume it's relatively recently, at least that's when we've heard about it, but I don't think it's as new as people think. And it often, revolves around the colleges and universities. I mean, I went to college in the 80s, as you said, in Brandeis, and this was already a debate I remember. Kind of what can you say? What gets you in trouble? What kinds of uh, questions do we need to think differently at? And there's a healthy debate about it. I mean, we think of it negatively, but there's something good about um, when it's kind of done well 
to seriously think about the words we use and the images we present and the way we relate with each other. Um, where you don't want it to go is where students of all or any political persuasion don't feel comfortable engaging in vigorous intellectual debate. And, you know, as a professor, I always try to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but obviously, when, when issues get very sensitive and heated, this is going to happen. In the 60s, with, you know, Vietnam on college campuses, it was the same thing. You know, there were complaints by students who supported the war, said, I can't say that because a lot of college students are against it. Um, but the debate itself was healthy and important for the democracy. So it's, it's about how do you do it rather than a, a sharp binary, do we have cancel culture or not? I think it's more about how do you have constructive yet very vigorous debate about these questions. Well, Julian, you wrote an essay last year called The Pub Public Intellectual in the Era of Twitter. Um, really interesting. And, and I guess it, it goes to the, the kind of the big question of you and your career, which is, you know, how does a rigorous scholar um, decide to enter into the public debate and, and be constructive and also be relevant to the, uh, the discussion? I mean, t talk about, because I mean, as we've mentioned, you have a podcast, you write yeah. amazing books, you're on CNN and NPR. Talk to us about how you're trying to, to contribute to the debate. Yeah, I mean, first, thank you. That's kind of you to say. Um, I've been doing this since 1998 uh, when I was teaching at SUNY Albany and Bill Clint President Clinton was being impeached and the local CBS show said, hey, do you want to come on TV and talk about it on like the morning news show? And I did it. And I've literally been doing this ever since and it's expanded and grown and I got, uh, I'm on bigger platforms and it wasn't intentional. I, I, I mean, I just was going to be a historian, but I've been doing it now for many, many decades. And uh, there's good and bad. The bad is it is a contentious media environment as we've been talking about. And so when you're out there in public, you are uh, subjected a lot to, you know, nasty, aggressive kinds of comments and threats and sometimes debates that are not particularly constructive. It's just a lot of yelling or uh, either literal yelling or written yelling, um, which isn't great. But the benefits are so wonderful, meaning um, you know, the ability to reach large numbers of people, even through a short op-ed uh, or a statement on television or a tweet, uh, you have a chance to try to, at a very small level, contribute to a better public dialogue. And uh, if you believe that's important, which I certainly do, this is a way to do it. And, and the way I do it, which has always been a kind of guiding principle, is to think about how to connect what the academy is doing, what historians and social scientists are doing, and at some level translate that into the public realm for people who aren't interested in reading all of that, but want to say, hey, how does that shape how I think of President A or B or how I think about, you know, what's going on uh, in Russia and Ukraine? And so it's not for everyone, but I have really found it quite rewarding and it helps my teaching. It always kind of informs some of the things I think about and even the way I present material to students, I think has gotten better um, because I'm also thinking on TV, how do I say something in about 20 seconds? Uh, it helps then when you're teaching and you have to present things clearly and in, in a crisp way. Uh, and similar for my writing. Uh, I mean, all of this swirls around in my head, but the, the biggest thing is just to contribute to a better public debate. We need this and we need people to do it. And um, that's why I keep working at it. Well, well, Julian, after I read your essay, I came across an essay by Alan Nevins, a wonderful historian from a, an earlier era. And he was talking about how academics and, and uh, journalists could work more be better. And he says, too often the academic tribe simply does not take the trouble to make its work decently alluring. It's true. I mean, it's a fair criticism of many disciplines. Uh, sometimes it's for good reason. And I, I guess as I've gotten older, I appreciate uh, it even more kind of genuine intellectual work free from, from the public. There's great benefit to it because the questions aren't always shaped. You can't guide everything in research by what's important for the moment. And so there's certainly a benefit. You see this in science, for example. You want scientists to work on long-term issues rather than just the issues of the day. But as I said, we need 
academics to be part of the public debate. And part of doing that is not just finding very good findings, but figuring out how to translate them to people so they're interesting and engaging. And that's what you do in the classroom. You can't just like throw everything at undergraduates and expect them to be interested. You have to make it interesting. Um, and so Nevins has an accurate argument there. And, you know, I'm just doing my small part to try to kind of think of ways to fulfill some of what he was calling for. Great. Well, Julian, I know you have a, a very, very busy day ahead of you still. So thank you for, uh, for taking so much time to visit with us. Uh, I would urge all the audience to read Julian's books. They're just this wonderful mix, I think, of, of scholarly rigor and also accessible to general readers. And it just it brings history to life in a, in a remarkable way. So Julian, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. Good luck right. to everyone. Thank you. And thanks to all you for joining this uh, this program. We will have it on our YouTube uh, station tomorrow. Please look at it and send it to family and friends. Read Julian's books. And thank you for supporting the Institute and keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.